Hi there. This is Father Jacob Bertrand. Today I'm with Father Joseph Anthony. Welcome to this episode of Live Splaining. Uh, Father Joseph Anthony, how you doing? This is our first time doing live splaining together, right? This is this is my first time on live splaining. Uh, first first time caller, long time listener. Uh, it's good. I'm happy so to be here. <laughs> how how are things in? in uh charlottesville charlottesville it's great um beautiful sunny day starting starting to feel like fall weather which is great because it's football season tailgating season mm, that's fine. uh you know university of virginia is 1-0 in football right now We're gearing up for a big game versus illinois tomorrow so um can't wait to go tailgating and just be back in you know college football land so it's super yeah. excited about that nice that kind of takes over the whole campus right like football game day yeah. Yeah. yeah it's um we are our church where we are is is maybe less than a half mile away from the football stadium so our church parking lot turns into actually a tailgating lot um so oh, yeah it's awesome and then we just walk over uh with students to the game and enjoy it so yeah super super excited about all of that fun stuff and it's just good to be back and seeing the kind of like unity that happens with school spirit and the beauty that uh you know college athletics uh provides to uh the student body and you know our student athletes and stuff like that so it was it was really hard last year to see all of our student athletes who pour themselves into the sports and uh into their athletics but it was it was just an awkward season across the board but this year we're in a good place um so I'm super excited about that and nice. we're gearing up for our fall retreat, which I can talk about like for years on end, but I'm going to shut it down right there. Not do that. Yeah. That's, that's all students though. That's not just like a freshman thing. Yeah. Fall so retreat, our, yeah. our fall retreat is for all of our students and we're um, bringing in Bill Dunahy from Theology of the Body Institute. So it's going to be a Theology of the Body retreat, uh, which cool. is really, really exciting. Cool. That's sweet. Yeah. That's very good. Very good. I approve. That's how I didn't. Oh, like, thanks. That's great. Yeah. I give your mm. my approval, but that's what it sounds like. So <laughs> sorry. Um, you don't need my approval. It's uh, got the Jancic approval. We can go right. forward, everybody. Indeed. Let's go. That's right. So, okay. Um, what we wanted to talk about today for a handful of minutes, kind of set the stage a bit, mm -hmm. is um, to talk about spiritual poverty and its role in the spiritual life and and what that means and maybe what it doesn't mean, but probably more what it means. Um, so we're going to chat about that for, I don't know, a handful of minutes, 10 minutes or something like that. And then we're going to turn it over to some, some questions. If you all who are listening have some questions, we have some questions from our Patreon supporters. Um, so we will... Uh, We'll get to those too. So um, yeah, let's start talking about spiritual poverty. Um, one of the things that as religious uh, we do that makes us religious is that we profess uh, vo the vows. We profess vows um, of the evangelical councils. So those councils are poverty, chastity, and obedience. I'm sure that's not terribly um, revelatory or like big news to hear that religious make vows. Um, and of those, of those councils or those councils where they're not they're not mandates of the spiritual life that's why they're called councils they're not commands but councils ways by which we are able to be more conformed to christ who is poor who is chaste, and who is obedient and you can look through uh sort of the history of the church and see saints um who lived these councils in different ways because we're talking about poverty uh you can th i think two saints who stand out here are saint francis and mother Teresa, who lived poverty um in very intense and very radical ways um that really shaped the church in in ways that that you know the ways that i guess the church hadn't been shaped before i don't know i guess that's what shaped means or implies um but the question remains is is poverty chastity and obedience uh, something that pertains only to the religious well, the answer to that is, in a sense, yes, and in a sense, no. In a sense, yes, in the in the sort of radical profession of those vows of, of living a radical poverty, radical chastity, radical obedience. Yeah, that's 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 the form. That's what gives form to religious life. But um, can we talk about should should all Christians be poor in some way? Yeah, we'll talk about that mm -hmm. as we go on. Should all Christians be chaste? Yes, they should. Could, should all Christians be obedient uh, to the church and to God and Yes, they should. So when we talk about these these councils with respect to the laity, um, uh, the we're talking more less in sort of a direct observance or adherence and more of something um, 
with respect to the spirit of it or um, a way of living it. So hence the title spirit of poverty. Um, so Father Joseph Anthony, what does that what does that look like, at least in some way uh, for for the Christian, for all the baptized yeah. who, are, mm -hmm. who are following Christ to live a spirit of poverty? I, I think one of those things is that uh, the disposition to how we interact with things. You know, we are human beings, right? We have to interact with things in this world. That's a great gift that we have. Um, but how do we interact with that? And it always comes to mind what St. Paul talks about when he writes, you know, what do you have that you have not received from another? And um, I, 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 like, I think it's helpful to draw a distinction between ownership and possession. Um, I've, I found that possession has a very kind of like closed mentality and it, it locks it down. And it's this kind of, um, it has like this just deep um, selfishness and that there, there isn't this uh, give and take. Well, with somebody who kind of takes ownership, it's this kind of subtle but humble recognition that I've received this from another. And for this period of time, I have ownership. I've been entrusted with this thing. And so there's this element of gratitude that immediately starts off, right? But also there's going to be an element of generosity where this I'm a steward of this and I can freely give because I freely have received. And so we don't need to be afraid to take ownership of things in our life. Um, but if we approach it with a, a spirit of poverty, um, it's this understanding of St. Paul that we are constantly the benefactors and the recipients of these good things in our life. And so too, we freely give of them to those in need. And so it, it starts to see it in a little more of a transient way. Whereas th I think those who um, possess things make the things their idols and their they end and then it becomes this kind of lockdown and you don't see a lot of generosity. You don't see a lot of uh, gratitude with respect to the things of this world. So I think when we, we talk about a spirit of poverty, it doesn't mean the radical um, material poverty that we would see in like a St. Francis of Assisi or things like that. But for all Christians, we can approach a spirit of poverty building from St. Paul saying, I'm actually a steward of the good things that God has given me through the hands of other people. And I receive that with gratitude, but also I'm free to give it with generosity. Yeah. And thinking about poverty and the spirit of poverty too, it, it, it begs the question of of like what is our relationship to material things right um so if we look at the councils poverty the the for the religious the vow of poverty frees us from our attachment to material possessions the vow of chastity from bodily goods the goods of marriage the vow of obedience um our gives our will to somebody else but when we're thinking about poverty um or another word that's often used in the spiritual life is detachment with mm -hmm. material things it's important to think um of like what what does uh what what is my relationship to the created world um yeah. am i made for the things and the comfort of this world ultimately or is there something more um and sometimes the and obviously the answer is there's something more uh i think that's right um but that then it's a, a, then i think is a question well how do we handle the things of this world do they become stumbling blocks um do they get in the way of our relationship with christ do they get in our way of our relationship with others, with our friends mm -hmm. and family or with, or with strangers or these sort of things. Um, we often, um, you know, m well, I'll say this money, like money and possessions aren't evils in themselves, but how they're, it's how they're used. It's, do they become idols or do they become, um, become sort of instruments to pursuing the common good to pursuing Christ in our own life, to pursuing, um, the, the bringing about of the kingdom, uh, for others. Um, and, and this idea of detachment, of being ready to dispose of our things. I mean, not like, you know, the next day you have to go out and sell everything you have. Um, but, you know, really, what is your heart after? What is what mm -hmm. is your, you know, heart and mind after? Is it um, is it things, comforts, or is it God? Um, is it is he the primary focus? Is he the the one that we're chasing? So there, there's a, um, I mean, that detachment from things is really, really important because it becomes this, element of well we actually we are always going to be attached to something we don't just get detached and become this like weird buoy in the ocean that's just getting thrown around by waves so the question is what are we attached to 
And if we find ourselves more attached to the temporal goods of this world, that means we are less attached to the eternal goods of God himself. And so when we begin to divest ourselves of the material goods of our life um, and become more detached, uh, less possessive of whether it's money or even the temporary goods of fame, uh, you know, those types of things, that allows us now the capacity to become more united and attached to God. Right. Yeah. When, when at the... Soon after the Dominican order was founded, there was when when mendicants, Franciscans and Dominicans in particular, the type of religion mm -hmm. that we are is mendicants. When when those religious orders were, were founded, there was a big controversy, which has been come to has come to be known the mendicant controversy about like what are these religious communities, how do they exist, and why do they exist? And in defense of the order, um, Saint mm -hmm. Thomas wrote uh, a small treatise on the Evangelical Councils uh, of Living Poverty, Chastity, and Obedience. And in setting up the reason for religious taking these vows, and we could then make the connection, the reason for the laity to live these councils in a in a in a mitigated way. Um, uh, he uh, he he does so by making the point that our will. Um, that it can only be attached to one thing at a time. Now, this can change very quickly. You know, from yep. I could I can see X and I can see Y and I can see Z and I can go back X, Y, Z. But ultimately, there's just there's one thing that I'm pursuing at a time. And this idea of poverty, this idea of detachment um, allows us to clear out some of the clutter, some of the things that would, um, I guess, occupy our attention rather than God mm -hmm. or distract us from the things of God or to use them properly. So, um, that's that's kind of what that is at is at root here is is what are we chasing what are we uh what are we good at what are we going after what are we pursuing what are what are our hearts set on um i think one other aspect here that we may be talking about uh, to talk about for a minute um is is the sort of comforts that we mm -hmm. introduce into our lives or the kind of like shields that we build up around ourselves our our novice master i think this was in the novice correct me if i'm wrong uh, probably was yeah i think he was talking about about this idea of detachment and he said that like even even um he or he knew this nun right yeah so this yeah this yeah it's 100 no shit. and um you know she had given up everything and yet like she was complaining about some sister taking or using her holy card or something that was in her breaver you know even this little even this nun who was so detached or would have seemingly been so detached was still concerned um about you know just her little holy card where it was so it's it we it's really a question of like you know, is that is that a comfort thing? Kind of like a, I don't know, what do they call them? Like comfort blankets? You yeah, know, comfort like, blankets. We, how do we soothe ourselves? Is it with the things of God? Also, have you ever tried a, a weighted blanket? Those things are comfortable as all get out. Yeah, it like hugs you. It's it's a little weighted blanket. They're great. So just another that's, issue. That's a good share. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have to say, for the record, I've not tried a weighted blanket. Um, but, 10 out of 10 baby 10 out of 10 recommend right. well now we know that father joseph anthony is super <laughs> detached except from his weighted blanket that he uses and and no i can it. appreciate a weighted blanket i'll give it to anybody that needs it i'll give it to you if you ever want one but i'm, I'm just fine. saying they're they're nice i'm fine thanks so well good i think we've said a bit enough about spiritual <laughs> poverty or the spirit of poverty uh at least to, to start yeah. things off if you all have questions about that or you know feel free to drop those in the in the comment or the chat um, YouTube chat bar thing. Um, so we'll answer them there. So let's turn to some Q and A. Uh, we have a handful of questions from our mm -hmm. donors, from our Patreon supporters. Um, so we're going to start with those, uh, at least some of those to get things going. And, uh, let's see. Oh, that, let's that's see. twice. We don't, we don't need it twice. Um, question one this is from John. What do Catholics believe about predestination? Uh, you want to take a, a whack at it and then I can follow yeah, up. You can, you can correct all my errors is basically Perfect. what he said there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, does the Lord want all of us in, in heaven with himself? Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, that this is the eternal will is that he, he desires us in, in eternity. But I, I think what predestination is commonly referred to like in, in more of a, um, a, a modern contemporary context is not that the, we have this like pre it's, it's more about predeterminism than predestination. Um, and it's like, there's nothing you can do to change the reality. 
and it takes out the human freedom from that capacity, which we know that our freedom is precisely the Imago Dei that the Lord has given us, and he's never going to destroy that. So I think that kind of predeterministic attitude of we are predestined or predetermined and there's nothing that we can do to change the course of future um is is absolutely contrary to our belief because it it's not within the christian anthropology in knowing how we are created in the image likeness of god because we contain our free will but the lord does desire us and you know we do have the as aquinas to talk about you know or not aquinas um sorry augustine you know, our hearts are made for the Lord and we're longing and we, they will not be complete until they're in his presence. So there's a, there is a predestination in the sense that we are predestined to be with him because we are created to, to be fulfilled in him. But yeah, I think, uh, the common parlance is, is more actually in effect a predeterminism and not necessarily predestination. Yeah. And when we look at how the Lord like works in creation, this is really what we're talking about with predestination that's an aspect of god of god working in creation so if we if we take a step back from that um uh we're we're there's we're talking about god's will so god has a will right he has an intellect and a will he is intellect and will and we're mm -hmm. formed in that image and then god's intellect or god's will working in creation is sometimes what we call divine providence how things just play out in creation and then often when we talk about predestination as father joseph anthony was mentioning we're talking about whether or not someone's going to heaven so predestination is god's providence or his will with respect to where we're headed um we really want to avoid the sense that um that this the concept the the protestant concept of double predestination that god creates some just to send some to hell yeah right that god creates souls to damn them um but so when we think about well how does this work with god's knowledge then does he know if i'm going to heaven and does that vitiate my freedom well god's operates outside of time such that his his knowledge is not always causative um he doesn't just because he knows he doesn't uh vitiate our freedom um but also we could say yeah god knows if i'm going to heaven or hell because he's god but he doesn't force that he doesn't cause that there there's a distinction we could say between god's antecedent will what he knows before uh, you know mm -hmm. before creation actually acts not that he's mm -hmm. changed by it but before creation actually acts and god's consequent will um and what happens after that's what we'd call a, a logical distinction god doesn't have two wills but just a way by which to kind of get around and see it okay let's look at a second question from our patreon donor maggie smith nice. here we go can you explain the relationship between mercy and justice? Is being just the same as being merciful? It's a good question. Um, it's a great question. Yeah. So, and it, it's actually kind of, you know, fits into the predestination bit. Um, right. So, the, what, I think a good definition for mercy is it's God's love in the face of sin. Mm -hmm. um, it's God's love in the face of sin. It's not my own. I'm stealing it from someone. I don't know. It might be John Paul II or somebody else. I don't know. It's I didn't come up with it. Um, and, yeah, origin, something like that. Uh, so God's love in the face of sin. So justice, justice is um, defined as rendering another his due. So what is somebody owed? And and that's that's really we can talk about different forms of justice or different parts of justice. But that's really what we're talking about is what is another yeah. person owed or do um it's inter interesting when saint thomas talks about like the virtue of religion or piety he puts that those are sub virtues of the virtue of justice because it's god is owed or dude worship or reverence or these sort of things um mercy though is is a different thing um they're not unrelated because god's justice has to do with us and god's mercy has to do mm -hmm. with us um but mercy is a sort of we sometimes think of it as like a tempering of justice that like you know i'm a sinner so i and do hell you know i'm owed damnation but god's merciful and loving um so he doesn't you know he forgives sins and and um and allows me to um you know to be in relationship with him to uh to love him these sort of things uh yeah i think that that gets at it a little bit any, yeah, any I mean, other comments from you father yeah i, I think <sighs> Once again, I think there's there's always kind of a misconception of how these words are thrown around con in contemporary ways. Like, I think far too many people think justice is just like rage and it's like retaliation mm -hmm. for things like after the fact, um, and which, you know, but there's actually like 
I think justice that like you were talking about, it's due to somebody that it is a just act to, you know, honor thy father and mother um, in, in those types of ways. So I, I think that justice and mercy like end up being like two sides of the same coin. They're, they're not counter each other. They're not against each other in any sense. Um, but they, they actually, they kind of interplay and are interwoven with each other. And mercy doesn't, um, doesn't temper justice when justice is like getting out of hand. Like when somebody is going off the rails and like is, is in rage, it's like, well, no, you need to be merciful. You need to be kind. Um, but I think mercy actually is making sure that somebody receives their due, even when maybe they, they don't merit it. Yeah. You know, um, and it reflects the Lord in that way. Um, yeah. All right, let's take a question from Austin Stonewall. Austin asks, hi, can you... That's Whoa, look at that picture. Says, look at that picture, uh, though. Yeah. Can Fresher. you talk a bit about what precisely goes into being properly disposed for receiving sacramental graces? I'm thinking of reconciliation in particular. Thanks. I'll let you take it, Father. Yeah, I mean, I think the proper disposition for sacramental graces is uh, partly uh, availing yourself to the sacraments, you know, showing up and, and desiring it. Um, there, there are certain, uh, you know, when the sacraments are effective in their operation, so we don't have to fear whether or not um, we receive the sanctifying grace and the sacramental grace when the sacrament is um, performed or accomplished, the graces are supplied. So that's, that's absolute. We don't have to fear that. Um, but the, what I think the question is starting to get at is some of the more kind of, um, devotional graces, maybe, uh, the, the graces of devotion and strengthening of how we receive in, in that way. So I think the first thing is how do we know that we're properly deceived? Sometimes it's a little more basic, in, in less, um, you know, less intricate, the fact that you show up and you desire these graces means that you're beginning to be properly disposed to that. Um, and I, I would kind of like even take a very, very basic step in that and saying like, yes, if you desire those graces and you show up to it, that's the, that's the proper disposition to it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I want to just leave it there. Um, you can talk about the differences of graces and, and things like that if you want to. Cool. All right. I think another question for you uh, from ND Irish. Do you brew beer for the tailgate? Ooh. So uh, first off, go Irish. I uh, grew up as a Notre Dame football fan through and through. And I'm a little bit in a conflict this year because Notre Dame is playing University of Virginia here in Charlottesville in November. <sighs> don't know what i'm going to do for that game um i think i'm going to end up rooting for uh for my boys at uva but it'll be a good game so i can't wait to watch notre dame play here in charlottesville um i do i brew beer for the tailgates no but i do i drink beer for the tailgates absolutely uh 100 um i got i have a few friends here in charlottesville that that work at breweries and things like that so we always are um well supplied for a tailgate let's put it that way Bless. I used to always make fun of Joseph, Father Joseph Anthony in the student tape when he would watch Notre Dame games because he would always say <laughs> we when referring to Notre Dame. Um, and he didn't it's go so to Notre true. Dame and he didn't play for Notre Dame. And there's no we. He's wholly unassociated. And I know it's a sports thing. Fine, whatever. But I still like to be prone. It's just good. Dude, Dude I forgot about that. You used to rail on me. You're like, Dude, you have uh, yeah, you have no association. Anyways. Who's the we? <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. Question from Guillermo. In Sodom and Gomorrah, there was not one single person worth saving. It is our duty to escape? How safe are you in the swamp? Well, I will answer the duty to escape part. Um, if you're talking about the swamp being DC or just life in general, DC, <laughs> mm, gosh, it just depends. I don't know. I, uh, I, I, hey. Fine, I guess. But is it our duty to escape? So, uh, what would I say? Um, you know, I think there's never been a point in history when, um, when civilizations, when cultures, when places, were not corrupt and uh, broken and, uh, you know, heading down the wrong path in some way or another? Uh, is it our duty to escape? Um, perhaps in some ways, perhaps not in others. I think this is there's a duty 
there's there's a wide breadth i think for interpretation so you have uh who wrote the the benedict option uh was it rod dreyer no uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this idea of sort of stepping aside from uh yeah, from kind of the the culture and, and rebuilding kind of catholic enclaves out in like you know kind of restarting in some ways mm -hmm. um that so that's one position my thought is tends to be that uh you know saints are called to be saints in places where they are and the world needs saints and uh just a sort of blind running away it doesn't convert the world um no. so you know christ became man and entered into into a pretty awful world um so i think we're called to to in some way mirror that and and work for the building of the kingdom yeah, I think, I mean, we can look into the Gospels and see a lot of actually the Lord's healings and uh, miracles that he performs. He sends people back to their homes. He sends them back to their hometowns and their cities and says, no, go back, like evangelize and and, and speak of what you've encountered here. Um, and I think of this past Sunday <clears throat> was the healing of the deaf man, Right. The Lord, you know, puts his fingers in his ears and spits on his tongue and all that kind of like really uh, tangible stuff. Um, but when we think about the deaf man, like at that time, a deaf person was entirely separated from society. They were entirely abandoned. They couldn't communicate. They couldn't really survive. There were no hearing assistance. There was no Braille. There was no American sign language to help this person be a part of society. For somebody who is deaf and mute, they were totally cut off. And so what the Lord does in his healings is actually restore somebody back into society, integrates them back into society. So I, I think that like um, I wouldn't be afraid of a society in any sense because we know that the Lord desires us to be to share in fellowship with our our peers and, and with humanity but it's it's going to take saints to to sanctify that so i don't i don't think there's a lot of fear that should be approached in that um in any way yeah probably just prudence and that's the, yeah yeah virtuous I'm, virtuous approach weird um, yeah cool good question thanks for asking all right our next question comes from maribel uh how does your congregation see gifts from family and friends mm -hmm. with the vow of poverty um Good question. Uh, typically, our uh, the way by which we handle that is that uh, is that any sort of monetary gifts are turned into the community. We can ask our superior uh, to keep some of that if we are going to use it for travel, or you know, if we need shoes or clothes or something. Or there's you know, there's something that's been discussed with the prior, but generally, monetary gifts or stipends or salaries certainly stipends and salaries from like oh God, yeah. from going mm -hmm. on preaching and, and that sort of stuff go to the community because that's how our community um uh what sustains itself that's how we pay mm -hmm. our bills by our preaching and by our by our our work and that sort of thing um as far as what like uh material gifts whether they be some clothes or something like that um typically we're allowed to keep those. Um, I know in, when we were in formation, we had to disclose it to our, to our yeah. uh, formator, what we were, you know, if we had received it, if we visit, we, the student brothers typically go home to visit their, uh, their, their families after Christmas, basically over the new year. Uh, and if so, if we were to receive any gifts, then we would have to let our uh, formator know when we got home. So yeah. um, that's pretty much and I think it's a, there's an important distinction. There's always been a distinction between like how Dominicans live their vow of poverty and how Franciscans live their vow of poverty, and um, for good reason. Like uh, a Franciscan has is in their life and their consecration weds themselves to Lady Poverty, right? And Dominicans, we wed ourselves to Lady Wisdom. And so uh, from the very beginnings, you know, Dominic always uh, allowed for certain exemptions for things like books and study to allow us to be better preachers of the gospel. And so there, there is a little more of um, kind of latitude when it comes, uh, comes to that. It has to be within line and vision of our uh, mission for be, being preachers in that sense. But it's not as a, kind of a explicit strict material poverty that we would find with the franciscans because it's a different charism yep fair um okay 
We have another question from Angela. Uh, when I first looked at this, I'm really bad at looking at the questions. Uh, I, that's all right. I saw Q-tips and I thought, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Second question from Angela. Second Q-tip. Uh, yeah. uh, tips on how to best grow in the virtue of heavenly prudence, of prudence. Um, it's a good question. Uh, well, I'll give you two resources. Uh, I'll give you three resources and then I'll say something about it. The first is um, that about a year ago, uh, my office, the Office of Vocations and the Timistic Institute co-sponsored a retreat here at the House of Studies called Choosing Well um, on the mm -hmm. Virtue of Prudence. And I know on the Timistic Institute, um, on, on their podcast, uh, those lectures are up there. So if you want to listen to some things on prudence and putting that into practice and what the virtue is, that was last October. So the end of October. So if you scroll back through their things, I don't know exactly how long. I know they take a, a little bit to get the the podcasts out from their lectures but it's on you should be able to find it um there's a really good book on the virtues called the virtues or the examined life by father romanus cesario that's a great introduction to the virtues um prudence included so that might be if you're looking to read something um that that's a, a great kind of digestible thing and then thirdly yet to be released but um i believe that one of the friars of our podcast is coming out with a book on prudence uh just after the new year so uh, wow. keep an eye out for that um i don't know if i'm supposed to say that but i didn't but you just did <laughs> so uh two ways to two things to mention now while we're, while while we're talking yeah. while you asked um one is to pray for the gift as dominicans we mm -hmm. believe in this in the idea of infused mm -hmm. virtues not just acquired virtues and the difference there that um with respect to the cardinal or the moral virtues of prudence justice temperance and fortitude um they can be acquired in the sense that you can practice them and grow in them. You can do um, you can do courageous things and grow in, and become more courageous, become grow in fortitude. But we also believe that those virtues can be infused, that God can give them um, in, a, in a sort of full and complete way. So we can and, and that acquired virtue also requires grace. You know, God moves. But um, we, there's a rich sort of idea in the Dominican and the Thomistic mind of the life of virtue. Um, so pray for it. You know, they're gifts from God to behave prudently mm -hmm. but also do you know practice prudence the a liar is a liar because he lies you know and a prudent person is a prudent person because they do prudent things even in small matters so that building up of of the virtue is it's just something that we we practice we pray for the grace and then in situations that demand you know decision making or that sort of thing we we make when we make good decisions, um, another like pithy phrase to throw is that grace builds on grace um, so that like as we become more prudent, uh, or as we do prudent things, we become more prudent. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think that there's a sort of like secret or, or like, you know, kind of thing. To, oops, just hit my mic. Secret thing to throw into the mix to become more prudent, but for doing prudent things, even in small matters. Um, so, yeah. And I, I mean, as we all know, like, you know, prudence is is, is a virtue it's in, a, in a sense. It takes it takes like kind of being well informed, having a well formed conscience. So, like in order to to use right reason, your your conscience has to be formed well. So, so don't be afraid to you know take time and and actually um, have intellectual endeavors to help you be informed on certain things, so that you know how to act well and what that yeah. looks like. So things like the podcast and those books on virtue, like that's part of, uh, and, and a very crucial part of learning how to act well is actually having a well-formed conscience so that you know how that your will can be informed through which you can act. Cool. All right, next question. I don't know how to pronounce your name, so I'm gonna say P-H-E-X, there you go. Is regularly smoking cigarettes combat compatible with a vow of poverty? Also, can one who has taken a vow of poverty freely go to a bar or drink, for example, coffee, juice, et cetera? Um, good question. Uh, I yeah, go ahead, Father. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is once again, like, you know, we want to make sure that um, when we talk about the spirit of poverty or a vow of poverty doesn't mean destitution. Like, it, it doesn't mean that we're like totally, um, you know, destitute and, and cannot supply for our needs. Um, there, there is a certain aspect that like we can engage in um, in each other's lives and, and whether that is going for you know, grabbing a cup of coffee with somebody or, or grabbing a drink with somebody or those types of things. So that's, we have to see it, you know, in a certain moderation and not that we are attached to these things. Like, you know, prudent use or moderate use of 
uh, tobacco and alcohol or, you know, caffeine for those types of things. Like mm, it's, caffeine, I'm it's, failing on that one. I just, for moderate use dude, caffeine, I am, but... all my students know, <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a caffeine fiend. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. yeah, see what I did there, but, and, and they're not, they're not, um, they're not against or anti uh, vow of poverty in any sense, if they don't become like strict attachments, like I was speaking of earlier, like we have to be detached from these things um, so that we can actually approach them for the good that they offer to us. But if we become overly attached and addicted and, and those types of things, then they do become these idols and we, we lessen our, our humanity because of those attachments there. Yeah, and it's it, as I think with one of the earlier questions I mentioned, we're given a small, you know, stipend a month for kind of incidental spending. So I certainly, we certainly, well, I live mm -hmm. in DC, Father Joseph Anthony doesn't, but, um, you know, I certainly can't go to most places and get like a drink in DC, you know, because it's like <laughs> super pricey. But, you know, to go out for a beer on occasion with a friend or something like that, yeah, that's well within the bounds of our, of our, um, yeah, of our living. I mean, it's, it's also. Cost. I was just going to say things also differ from community to community on how, yeah. what kind of rules are there. So, and I also think like there's, there's a beauty to uh, being gen generous with what we have. Like, you know, we, father Jacob Burton is correct. Like we each receive a monthly stipend. And one of the beautiful things I love about our Dominican life is every friar in the priory receives the same stipend. Now, it, you know, depending on where that location is, right. Um, it doesn't, it's not always the same across the province, but each in the, each priory, everybody receives the same stipend, whether you're the prior or the youngest brother in the house, it doesn't matter. But we also, you know, we have a certain, um, desire and kind of call to be generous with those stipends that we have. So like, you know, whether that means supporting, uh, a missionary or being, uh, supporting certain charitable causes and, and charitable arms of the church, uh, even with that, what has been given to us is also, it gives us that ability to make a prudent decision and support others who are also in need. And maybe that is just buying a cup of coffee for a student or buying a cup of coffee for a friend and saying, I got you covered on this one. Like we can also be generous with a small stipend that we have too. Cool. Uh, let's see from Lauren Borowski. Hi Lauren. How you hey doing? Lauren. Uh, what recommendations do you have on filling your day with times of prayer uh, and study, silent prayer, liturgy, L-O-T-H, liturgy of the hours? I'm getting better at abbreviations on a previous live explaining episode. Um, someone uh, put JC and I didn't know what that was. And then Father Gregory had to remind me that JC stands for Jesus Christ. So, the big man. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, I'm not going to lie. Listen, I read L-O-T-H. And in my head, I translated that as L O T R. So I'm like silent prayer, Lord of the Rings, Rosary. <laughs> yep. No, like, I think liturgy of the hours. So silent hey. prayer, liturgy of the hours, rosary, divine mercy chaplet, etc. Without falling into the trap of simply checking items off a list. That's a good question. Um, we don't want to become list checking Catholics. So I think here what's important on on avoiding a sort of task um like oriented faith is to uh to look at these things as uh, with respect to whether or not they are helpful and conducive to your own prayer. Now, some of us who are religious and priests are obligated to particular things. So we have to pray the liturgy of the hours. That's, that's part of our, our job as it were. Um, but you know, as uh, a lay woman, you don't. So is it, uh, I think asking the question of, okay, are you, um, are you taking, you know, are you doing these things? Are you, are you making time for silent prayer, liturgy of the hours and rosary to do that because you think you have to, or because they help you, uh, structure your day in your relationship and your, with our Lord and your prayer schedule. Um, the, the, the important principle here is that there's nothing that we can do, um, that like makes God give us more grace. Um, you know, we can't like, it, it's not, and I, the, the, the idea that if I just figure out the perfect prayer routine and get like eight things instead of seven, then somehow I'm going to be holier. It's like, well, uh, we have to balance that with the reality that God is God and we have to be well disposed to be in a relationship with him, but we don't need to like necessarily always do more, um, mm -hmm. to facilitate 
facilitate that relationship. So I think it's really good to, to like, as you try different things, uh, from that's a great list of devotions and, and, and prayers, uh, and, and ways to engage in the spiritual life as you try different things. If you're like, well, the liturgy of the hours is just like office of readings is just not for me. It's like, okay, fine. You know, that's it. So, or maybe it's a seasonal thing. Like, I'm just like, this is really dry right now. And then like you come back during Advent to a practice or something, you know, so flexibility there. I think this is like questions about prudence that we had where the question of prudence really kind of comes in as to what's like good, useful, conducive to your growing closer to God. Yeah, I, I want to wholeheartedly second a lot of that in the sense that um, there are the ordinary means of sanctification, right? Sacrament life pursuing virtue like those are the ordinary means of sanctification but when it comes to devotions those are personal and that's that's very you know dependent on the individual and to not be afraid to like um it's more i think it's more about finding a rhythm of prayer than specifics of it so that you know like okay i'm going to you know pray in this certain rhythm uh different points of my day or whatever it is, depending on the obligations of my life. You know, if the obligations of my life don't allow me to attend a midday mass every day, then I'm not able to, you know, but maybe allow a morning mass uh, and then obligations of life change and you can adapt and, and go with that. But I think that final thing that, um, the final thing you were saying, Father Jacob is very important is like, don't be afraid to be flexible with um, seasons. Like, okay, for this season of my life, the, the the rosary was extremely helpful for me, but now it's kind of getting dry. So I'm going to go back to, let's say, um, journaling or those types of things. Like, don't be afraid to kind of keep, and, and that doesn't mean that the prayer wasn't good for you at a, at a different season. So I think when it comes to a strong prayer life, it's more about having a good established rhythm of prayer that is uh, kind of keeps you buoyed up in the life rather than these specific things. Because I think if you focus too much on the specifics, then it does become a check off list. It comes a to-do list instead of fostering a, a relationship with the Lord with that. Cause that's what, that's what our spiritual life is supposed to be is drawing us deeper into the relationship with God himself. And as we all know, with relationships, it kind of takes different turns as the relationship grows, you know, and not to be afraid of that. Great. All right. Um, from Marie, here we are. Fathers, I read that the Jesuit theory of predestination is different from yours. Can you please explain the difference in layman's terms? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, that one's on you. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think, so one of the things that is difficult in, um, in trying to answer questions about this school versus that school is whether or not, you know, there's a school that all Jesuits ascribe to with respect mm -hmm. to their theology. So maybe not all Dominicans are Thomists and follow St. Thomas, but Thomas is, you know, the Dominican theologian that most, you know, that the Dominican tradition follows. So you can, you can say, well, what do Dominicans think about this and rely on Thomas generally for the Jesuits? There are, there are some kind of influential thinkers, um, especially in the Counter-Reformation, who uh, kind of shape the way Jesuits think about things. Um, as far as predestination, I'm not sure. The two things that I'm more familiar with where Dominicans and Jesuits would differ is on, on ideas of grace and how God's work um, in grace and, and how we receive grace um, how that works, Thomas's account versus the the sort of Counter Reformation Jesuit account, and and then kind of how that later identified, uh, ide or was later kind of shaped, not identified, but shaped Jesuit thought. Um, and then the other thing is with respect to sort of the virtues and 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 the vir and kind of approaching um, the virtues and like the end of the moral life. So there would be debate there between Jesuits and, and Dominicans, at least in a theological um, theological argument. But I'm sorry to say. With respect to predestination, I'm not sure. Um, I think here too, there. I think there's less of a with predestination. I think there's less like to talk about virtue theory and how the virtues work and that sort of thing. There's there's some like uh, I guess room for interpretation, but there there's a pretty clear Catholic do Catholic doctrine on predestination, which is what we talked about earlier. So it's a little harder to sort of say there are these kind of different theories or different things that. The, I'll just say like the path for orthodoxy is a bit narrower on, on something mm -hmm. like this. So I'm sorry that I wasn't able to give you more details, but um, that's, that's where, uh, 
that's what I'm offer. That's what I'm able to offer. So, <laughs> okay. Another question from PHEX again, sorry if I'm, I'm sure that's a different way to say that circumstances are such that I cannot make a Thanksgiving after mass without sacrifice of my breakfast. I know that I should make a Thanksgiving after Eucharist, but should I sacrifice breakfast every day? Father thoughts? Um, I'm not quite sure how deep and how long a Thanksgiving is for you. I think a Thanksgiving can be something very, very short. You know, if if once again, your circumstances don't allow you to have prolonged periods of prayer in a church, that's fine. You're not a cloistered nun like you. The Lord has entrusted you other obligations in life and that you have to attend to those things. So, uh, you know, you can make a very short Thanksgiving like, thank you, Lord. I love you. That's a Eucharistic Thanksgiving, you know, um, and then to be attentive to the circumstances and obligations of your life also in a um, in an implicit way is actually a thanksgiving to the Lord for what he's done and what he's entrusted to you. So I wouldn't fear that. I mean, there's always this kind of ache within our hearts that we could be spending and devoting more time to the Lord and we could be giving more. Like, I think that's just a, that's a good ache to have, but also to just constantly take a step back and say, well, what's within my, what's legitimately and, and, like respectfully within my duties. And if that's just a short Thanksgiving, the Lord doesn't really care about quantity so much as quality. So just give what you have and, and entrust it to the Lord. That's it. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say anything differently. So I think that's, that's spot on. Um, it really matters. Like what matters is what you're able to give. So, mm -hmm. um, Great. Okay, let's take another question from a um, from a Patreon supporter, uh, Matthew O'Connor. Matthew asks, "How should we relate to God? Should we always relate to God as Father?" Uh, that's a good question. Um, how should we relate to God? Um, well, I think a couple of things. Uh, first, our relation to God is is defined on sort of God's terms. I think sometimes we like to think that the spiritual life is is wholly subjective and personal that like, you know, it's about how I relate and how I kind of find him. And, you know, we were talking from Lauren's question earlier about this, like the practices of the spiritual life and what works. And yeah, that's, that's one thing, but um, God reveals himself in a particular way and did so most particularly through his son, uh, through Christ who became, you know, Christ is the culmination of revelation and the way by which we relate to the father most directly. Now in terms of like, is father always father or is father, um, creator, or do we think as, as of God as the redeemer? Uh, or I think, um, this is a little, um, I guess what back pattery here, uh, the other night, uh, father Patrick and I had an event at the Catholic information center in Washington, DC, a, a book launch. And one of the things that we talked about in the book is, um, how the Dominican often thinks of God as friend, um, particularly mm -hmm. from, from Christ calling the apostles and Dominic had this notion of that, that the Dominicans are going to be apostles, you know, apostles and Christ calls the apostles, his friends. So I think often Dominicans think of friendship with God. So that another way, um, but here I think it, it's a question of, well, what you could say kind of what works for you, um, where like as Dominicans, as I'll speak for myself and father Joseph Anthony can differ if he wants, but there's, there's this, we're formed in a kind of Dominican tradition that has this notion of, of friendship. Um, mm -hmm. but I know like, uh, this is something I mentioned the other night. I was with summer projects with focus this summer, uh, father Joseph Manley spent some time with them too, in a different location, but their, their retreat that they go on for the students is, is called the father's house. And it's about the prodigal son and relating to God as father. So, um, we can get at different things by, you know, seeing how God reveals himself differently, but it's really kind yeah. of what works. I love that father's house retreat. I've led that thing seven or eight times and it's powerful every single time. So I love that. But I think that however we approach God in the triune Godhead is actually never not including the other persons of the Trinity. You know, they're always unified together. And specifically in how Father Jacob, like you were saying, how he's revealed himself, like it's in our baptism that we are, you know, made co-heirs with Christ. We we are united to him in his divinity. And so now we can stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, the anointed one, 
the eternal son in gazing at the father, right? Receiving the father's love and returning that father's love, which is the Holy Spirit, right? That, that kind of dynamic of love between the father and the son that we are now incorporated into. So at, at any point, you know, whether we are kind of meditating on this union that we have with the eternal son, through our baptism and through his invitation to be, you know, to share friendship with him, or we are looking at the father receiving his eternal love of the father, right. And, and having that dynamic, which then draws us into the Holy spirit itself. Like at any point we're incorporating all others. And if for a moment we are focusing on one aspect of that Trinity for a moment, we're focusing on this other one. It doesn't necessarily exclude the others you know they're all in a in active uh dynamism in that way yeah yeah great all right so i think we have uh let's see question again from guillermo we could show this so the second fatima prayer um i don't know uh, second Fatima prayer. I just looked it up because I didn't know it. But my God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. Is that all souls or just the ones in purgatory? Um, I would assume it's all souls. Yeah, uh, I would think so. Yeah, um, I'm not terribly familiar with the sort of spiritual spirituality or teachings around that but i would assume that would pertain to all souls to our own souls too um not just to the souls in purgatory uh so great uh from jennifer uh interesting i've always heard god created us so he is our father often i get mm -hmm. told in the word it says call no one on earth father i've never heard god as friend um yeah uh so right you know god creates and god is creator god is father in that way god reveals himself as father he does so in the mm -hmm. in the old testament um uh in in sort of different ways um being the father of israel and the sort of nuptial imagery through the prophets um all of these kind of things and then does i guess most what would we say emblematically is that a word um emblematic is now man yeah claim uh, it they have it uh Boom. in in christ's relationship and teaching as god you know of god as father um so uh yeah father obviously but if we look at the last supper um in john i believe it's john 15 15, 15 right yeah 15, um, 15. I, right yeah i no longer call you servants but i call you friends um if we take the last supper to be sort of what what is often called these these prayers the high priestly prayers right before Christ leaves, there's there's a real way that Christ changes the orientation of the apostles' relation to him, um, to to have one of uh, a friendship, to know God mm -hmm. as a friend. Um, so it's a, it's a really powerful kind of thing. I, without fail, I know that's one of the readings at profession, one of the options yep. for readings and at ordination. Is that true? Um, yeah, we had it at all of ours. I yeah. Mean, so just like a, a wedding, you can choose from a list of, of mm -hmm. uh, scripture passages for like a wedding mass or a funeral mass, same thing for a profession mass or an ordination mass. And we often, Dominicans often choose something from the high priestly prayer, John 15, a lot. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a really awesome thing to think about and, you know, to meditate on, to take to prayer, to think about that sort of thing. So, and, and I think the, you know, that, that kind of like, <laughs> Why is that so revolutionary? Why is this so important that God calls us friend, right? I mean, because friendship has to be shared between kind of equals. Yeah. And, and we are not equal to God. Like, I'm not afraid to say that I am not equal to God. I may think that I am, and I may act like I am sometimes, but I'm not equal to God, let's face it. Um, but the Lord Jesus in his generosity elevates us to, to divinity. And so now we can share in his friendship, which is not proper to us, but it's a gift. And he gives that that ability and that capacity to be friends with him as a supreme gift. And so this whole concept of friendship with God is, is absolutely revolutionary, uh, really in all the world religions. Like there's no other world religion that claims 
that the creature could be friend with the creator. And, and yet Jesus humbles himself to take on our humanity so that we can be elevated to his divinity. And that's why in that, um, you know, high priestly prayer, John 15, he's talking about the vine and the branches, but he then calls us friends and goes one step further and says, you know, what's the, what's the mark of true friendship? Well, to lay down your life for your friend. And I lay down my life freely for you. So not only does he talk about it and give us this kind of like bullet point understanding, but then he actually inaugurates it by his own actions of laying down his life for us, his friends. Yeah. And I think another place to check this out too is uh, it's not as direct or as, as specific with respect to friendship, but to what Father Joseph Anthony was just talking about that, that, that gift um, where that, that friendship is on offer because Christ became man. And there's mm-hmm. this beautiful hymn, uh, they call it, or canticle in, in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, um, that it's just like a summary of our faith. Um, so it's really beautiful. We pray it a lot at, in our in the Liturgy of the Hours, but you know, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Um, check that out too if you're looking for another. So that one and John 15, 15 are some excellent passages on this. Um, cool. Uh, here's a question from Haley. Uh, I heard that an exorcist from DC said that he has evidence of demonic of uh, demonics being able to text. I have assumed for a while that people possessed can type in a chat or text. Is there anything we could uh, that we can or should do uh, with this information? Um, probably not. I mean, there's there's yeah. I mean, th- those types of things are so rare. Um, you know, when when demons. Once again, they can they they're so jealous of God Himself because He can create and they want to imitate that, but they can only really manipulate, uh, and that includes matter. But it takes so much for them to actually manipulate matter that is discernible, um, that they don't they want to be hidden. They don't want to reveal themselves uh, in in any sense. So I don't there there's nothing to fear um, in having that knowledge. I mean, it's it's no different than any other aspect of. Um, you know, the demons manipulating matter in any sense to get attention or, or anything like that. Once again, the victory is won by Christ. Anything that the, um, the demons do in any capacity is just surely to induce fear and intimidation. And if you constantly remind yourself that the Lord has won the victory, he's destroyed sin and death, and I have nothing to fear. Um, no, no matter how um, that engagement happens, there's there's nothing to fear and there's no need to think how do i now live differently if i read this text message is it something manipulative no just just breathe easy remind yourself of the victory of jesus christ and his specific love for you um his friend um in that way and go forward all right. I think we have time for just one last question. Another one from uh, from a Patreon donor that says, what is the best way to praise and to worship God? Um, great question. I would say, first and foremost, to uh, to attend the sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, the Mass mm-hmm. is the highest form of prayer and praise that we can, that we can render unto God. Um, so uh, that's that. And then... Um, pursuing our lord in all things you know so in making time for him in prayer and living the christian life and witnessing to the christian life um you know and living the life of virtue and and these sort of things we magnify god's glory um in leading other people to christ all of these ways by which the christian life is lived well um i think praise and worship god but at at the height par excellence it's it's the mass so yeah. Any final word on that, Father, before we wrap yeah, up? Yeah, I, I think I kind of made reference to it earlier, but living the ordinary means of sanctification, you know, living a sacramental life, a pursuit of the Lord in prayer and in virtue, um, those are the best witnesses and, and ways to praise the Lord in your life, in your words, in your actions, in your being, and to worship Him. Um, so that details and and demands a certain element of surrender and of humility but at the end of the day it's just devoting yourself to those ordinary means of sanctification and then if you want to go a little further maybe i would say listen to this podcast on a regular basis and join our patreon supporters i think that's a great way to praise and worship the lord himself is to become one of our patreons and to help us continue this work here that's great. Well, thanks so much for that, Father Joseph Anthony. It's a real, real winning way to wrap things up. Um, Shameless the, here. Yeah, Shameless. I know. <laughs> uh, 
thanks for all of you who tuned in live this afternoon. It was great to, to answer your questions. It's a lot of fun for us. So um, as we've said before, uh, we'll have another episode of live explaining at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time two weeks from now. I don't know the date offhand, but every other Friday. Um, so there you have it. If you'd like uh, to have your questions prioritized, feel free, as Father Joseph Anthony so graciously put it, um, to become a Patreon supporter and you can submit your questions there ahead of time and we'll be sure to get through them or get to them uh, on the episode. Otherwise, uh, feel free to check out our regular Thursday episodes, our guest explaining episodes every other Monday. We have some exciting guests coming up, so, so stay tuned for that. Um, but as always, thanks for your support. Thanks for your prayers. Know that we're praying for you all. And until next time, God bless. <laughs>